to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ how is the church of the new testament organized how does it worship according to the Bible? And by what designation or name is the church identified in the New Testament? We welcome you to our third series in our evangelistic lessons. We hope that you'll have your Bible ready and stay tuned as we're going to study these subjects together today. In Acts chapter 14, verse number 23, the Bible clearly teaches that the organization of the church, it is governed by a plurality of elders. When we talk about organization, we realize Jesus is the head of the church. But those whom God has put in place are elders and deacons, and then all members work for the same common goal with them. Notice the plurality of elders mentioned in Acts 14, verse number 23. The Scripture says, so when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Now, the question we want to ask based on Acts 14, 23 is, did these inspired men appoint elders in every church? The Bible clearly says they did. They appointed elders in every church. Well, friend, would we be right if we did as they did in appointing elders, a plurality of elders in every congregation? If we followed that pattern, wouldn't we be following the pattern of organization of the Bible? What about if we put something in place different than that? Could we be wrong if we did not organize the church the way these inspired men did? Meaning if we put one man in place or we put a board of deacons or a one-man pastor system, is that according to the Bible? Well, no, it's not. In fact, Acts chapter 20, verses 17 and verse 28, the elders are designed to be the overseers of the church. Acts 20, verse 17, Paul is writing to or discussing with the elders of the church in the area of Ephesus. And he says to these men in Acts 20, verse 28, Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Are the elders designed to be overseers? Yes, they watch over. They care for people's souls. They try to help keep the church pure as God designed for it to be. And friend, as we think about elders in the New Testament, there are clear qualifications that you find in the Bible for who can and who cannot be an elder and what their responsibility is. Notice Titus chapter 1 verses 5 through 7, as it discusses the qualifications of an elder. The Bible says, For this reason, Paul speaking, I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking, and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable. When we think about the qualifications of elders in the church, it's clear that not everybody meets those qualifications. You've got to be an older person, married, have children. It must be a, a man. The husband of one wife clearly designates that responsibility was given for male leadership in the New Testament. And so we want to make sure that these men are qualified who are put in as well. 1 Timothy 3 verses 1 through 7 again mentions these qualifications. From that, must an elder be married? Well, yeah, he's got to be the husband of one wife. Must an elder have children? Having faithful children, the text clearly says. Can a new convert or a novice be an elder? No, the Bible clearly says that he cannot. And so there are definitive guidelines for putting in elders in every congregation. Each congregation is autonomous in that that local eldership tries to oversee and lead that congregation according to the Word of God. Now, what about 
further noting about the uh, organization of the church. According to 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 through 12, the church also has deacons. Listen to 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse number 8. Of the qualifications and roles of deacons, the Bible says, Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. Now, what's the office under discussion here? It's a deacon. As we find in the Bible, the word deacon means a servant. They're given an official capacity to serve him. And thus, is it God's plan that there be qualified elders and deacons in every congregation? Yes, that's the pattern that you see. In fact, Philippians 1.1 kind of puts it in a nutshell. Paul writes to the elders, the deacons, and the bishops, or the bishops and the deacons, and all the saints in Philippi. Here you've got kind of the organization in a nutshell. Bishops are elders, deacons, and all saints are all Christians. And so... You know, if we're going to think about being the, or we want to be the church of the New Testament, then it's got to be organized the way God wants it to. And someone says, well, what's the importance of all that? Friend, may I ask you to consider this? Where in the New Testament do you find things like you find today for organizations of various groups? Meaning, where do you find the Pope in the New Testament? Where do you find one man running the whole show? Well, you don't find that. In fact, here's what you do find. In Matthew 23, 9, Jesus said, Call no man father. We're not to look up to someone and call them father in a religious sense. Where do you find a board of deacons running a congregation? Not without elders, and the elders are always the ones who are the overseers or the shepherds of the congregation. Where do you find women elders or deacons? Well, you don't find that in the New Testament. Both are to be the husband of one wife, which clearly designates that as a role that men are to fulfill and to submit to. And so the organization of the church helps us to identify the Lord's church as the body you find in the New Testament. But friend, as we think about the New, church, New Testament church and being a member of the Lord's church, we also want to realize that the way the church worships helps us to designate it as the church you find in the New Testament. How did the church worship in the first century? Do you remember John 4 verse 24? Jesus said, God is a spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now friend, is it the case that we've got to worship God in spirit, meaning our, our whole person and emotion and be engaged in it and in truth? Absolutely. I've got to worship God not just with the emotion and the feeling and, and heartfelt, but it's got to be guided by truth, which is the Word of God. John 17, 17 reminds us what truth is. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them by your truth. Your Word is truth. Now what is truth? Jesus clearly said the Word of God is truth. Here's the application. Since we've got to worship God according to the truth, must we worship God as He's told us to in the New Testament? Well, friend, that's where we find what truth is. And let us never forget that the putting of man's tradition as commandments and doctrine is clearly condemned in the Bible. Jesus said this in Matthew 15, 9, In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. First question we ask is, is it possible to worship God in vain? Well, yeah, Jesus clearly said there, some were worshiping Him in vain. How'd they do that? If we worship God according to the commandments of uninspired men, is God going to accept that? Well, friend, He's clearly not because that would not be following the teaching of the Bible. Well, let's then direct our attention to how the church or the New Testament worshipped and how we ought to follow that pattern as well. What did the New Testament Christians do as part of their worship? 
the first thing we notice is that Jesus commanded His disciples to eat the Lord's Supper. I want you to listen to the words of Luke chapter 22. As Jesus discusses the Lord's Supper as an action of paying honor and glory to God, He said these words beginning in verse number 19. Jesus said, And He took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Do, Jesus would then go on to say again, Do this in remembrance of me. Is it the case that Jesus commanded his disciples to partake of the Lord's Supper? Well, friend, he absolutely did. Jesus clearly said, Do this. There's the command. Do this in remembrance of me. Now we learn from 1 Corinthians 10 verse 16, the cup that we bless, it's the cup of the communion of the blood of Christ and the bread that we break, it's the communion of the body of Christ. And so as we think about the Lord's Supper, the cup represents the blood and the bread represents the body, the totality of the sacrifice that Jesus gave. But here's another question we want to consider. How often should Christians partake of the Lord's Supper? Some people do it two or three times a year, some monthly, some maybe even different than that. Is there any type of designation in the Bible when Christians did that? Would you direct your attention to Acts chapter 20? And I want you to notice what the Bible says in verse number 7. That's Acts chapter 20. And let's see how often did the New Testament church partake of the Lord's Supper. Acts chapter 20, verse number 7. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. They came together on the first day of the week. Now, there's a parallel in the Old Testament that helps us to really crystallize how God wants us to interpret this language. Let me give you an example. Do you remember in Exodus 20, verse 8, where God said to the Israelites, Remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. Okay, when God told the Israelites, remember the Sabbath, how did they interpret that? Did God mean for them to keep every Saturday that rolled around? Well, they absolutely did, and that's how they interpreted that. When those Christians met on the first day of the week to eat the Lord's Supper, did they do it on the first day of each week? Well, absolutely. And should Christians today eat the Lord's Supper? On the first day of the week, according to 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, they came together every first day of the week. What's the purpose of their coming together? To break bread was a big part of that purpose. And so they're coming every first day of the week, and it's for the purpose of breaking bread and remembering the great sacrifice that Jesus made for them. Now, a second item that we see that the New Testament Christians participated in was giving. I want you to notice 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And friend, please understand, as we're talking about giving, we're talking about an individual giving at the local level, at the congregation that he is our member of on the first day of the week. We're not begging you for money today or things like unto that. This is a command of God between God and man, and it occurs in the local congregation. Listen to 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2. The Bible says, Paul speaking, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, some versions say every week, on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Friend, is it God's will that we give as we've been prospered? Yeah, Paul specifically said, give as you've been prospered. Are we to make a contribution to the local congregation on the same day we partake the Lord's Supper? Now, friend, I want to show you an inconsistency here that helps us to realize people can understand the language of the Bible. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 says, On the first day of the week we're to lay by in store as we prospered. Anywhere you go, almost 99% of places anywhere you go are going to pass the collection plate every Sunday. You know what's amazing? The languages are parallel. On the first day of the week, we're laid by in store. 
eat the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week? How come we can understand that when it comes to contribution, but we have a hard time understanding that when it comes to the Lord's Supper? That shows an inconsistency that we can actually, and people do, understand that language. Now, a third action that Christians participate in when it comes to worship of the church is singing. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19 designates that we are to sing and praise God with our voices. Listen to these words. The Bible says, We are speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Are Christians to sing as a part of their worship? Well, the Bible specifically says, Sing and make melody. Does this passage here, though, mention mechanical instruments of music? No, we read, read through it. It says, sing, make melody in your heart, praise God with our voice. We find no mention here of mechanical instruments of music. In fact, church historians tell us that the followers of Christ did not use musical mechanical instruments of music in their worship for hundreds of years after Christ left the earth. The Greek Orthodox Church, which split off from the Roman Catholic Church, has never used it in their worship. In fact, when you attend the worship of the Church of Christ, you'll notice we don't use mechanical instruments of music. And here's maybe a, a comparison to help you understand why. In Genesis 6, verse 14, think with me about Noah building the ark. In Genesis 6, 14, here's what God told Noah. Make you an ark of gopher wood. Hey, now think about this with me. When God told Noah what to do, was that all that he wanted him to do? And did God specify? Would Noah have sinned if he had built the ark out of, let's say, mud or metal? Well, yeah, God said, make it out of wood. Would Noah have sinned if he'd built the ark out of oak or ash or hickory? Yeah, God not only told the, the type, but the kind of wood to be used. And so God told Noah, of the three that we mentioned today, metal, mud, or wood, which did God say? Wood. Of three different types of wood, oak, ash, or gopher, which did God say? Gopher. And so he not only told the kind or the type, he told the kind. Now, when we think about music, this is a parallel, okay? When God said gopher wood, that automatically eliminated any other kind of wood. When God said sing, make melody in your heart, that automatically eliminated any other kind of music. You've got music and then you've got two types, vocal and mechanical or instrumental. Well, God said sing, not play. God specified how we are to worship Him according to song. Remember Leviticus 10 verses 1 and 2? Nadab and Abihu offered an unauthorized fire to the Lord which He had not commanded them. Where in the New Testament is the command to use instruments of music? Now I know People will say, oh, wait, wait, it's under the Old Testament. Remember, we've already studied in Bible Authority lesson that we're living under the New Testament. That's the law we're going to be judged by. I don't worship, but I'm not saved like they were under the Old Testament. Now, think about it this way. Was God upset with Nadab and Abihu when they made changes to His law? You bet He was. Must we be careful not to make changes today? To illustrate it maybe like this. In Matthew 26, verses 26 through 29, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. He took the unleavened bread. It represented His body. He took the fruit of the vine. It represented His blood. And He commanded them, eat this bread, drink this fruit of the vine, do this in remembrance of me. Now, friend, you ask yourself this. Would it be a sin if we put grape jelly on the bread to make it taste better? Would that be okay? Might taste a little better. Would, you, would that be all right with God? Well, God's not commanded us to. Would it be a sin if we'd uh, spice up the grape juice a little bit? Instead, maybe we put Dr. Pepper on the Lord's Supper on Sunday morning. Would that be okay? Just, just make it taste a little better. Maybe somebody doesn't like grape juice, so I like Dr. Pepper better. Would, would it be okay if we did that? Can we make changes like that? Would it be a sin to put maybe hamburgers and milkshakes or pizza and sweet tea on the Lord's table? Would that be okay? Well, friend, we realize those things are not authorized. God told us what He wanted. He wanted unleavened bread through the vine. Not bread and jam, not hamburgers, and not milkshakes. God wants music, and He specified the type and the kind. Sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord. We realize Noah would have sinned if he'd used any other kind of wood beside gopher. 
And God didn't approve at all of Nadab and Abihu making changes to the fire. And He rained down fire in heaven and killed those men. Friend, if it was wrong for them to make changes, why would it be right for us to do the same today? And so we need to realize God has authorized how we're to worship Him in the New Testament. But friend, as we think about the Lord's church today, let's also realize that God has specifically told us how the church is to be designated, that is, the name that it is to be called by. Do you remember Matthew 16, verse 18? Jesus said to Peter, And I say to you that you are Peter on this rock. The statement you made, I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Friend, who built the church? According to Jesus' words in Matthew 16, 18, well, Jesus said, I will build my church. Jesus said He was going to build whose church? His church. If, if Jesus said He was going to build whose, His church, whose name should it wear? In Acts 20, verse 28, Paul told the elders in Ephesus, Take heed to yourself and to the whole flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God or the church of the Lord which He purchased with His own blood. Who paid the price? Who purchased the church? Jesus did with His own blood. If Jesus purchased the church, whose name it ought it to wear? Whose name should it wear that brings glory and honor to the one who purchased it? In fact, not only that, but do we realize that naming religious groups after men is actually condemned in the Bible? I want you to listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And in the New Testament, they tried to name the church after men, and Paul specifically forbid them from doing that. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I want you to notice what the Scripture says, beginning in verse number 10. Paul says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now watch what they're doing. Paul says, Now I say this, each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Friend, ask yourself this. Would it have been a sin in the New Testament, according to these words, to name the church after Paul or Apollos or Cephas or any other human being? Absolutely. Paul said, don't do that. Division's wrong. If the church were named after Paul, who would that be glorifying? Well, it would glorify the Apostle Paul. If the church were named after some religious act, such as repentance. Who would it be glorifying? Repentance. Friend, if it's a sin to name the church the Pauline church, would it be a sin to name the church the Lutheran church, glorifying Martin Luther? If it were a sin to name it the repentance church, glorifying repentance, would it be a sin to name it the Baptist church, glorifying baptism? Where do you find Lutheran or repentance or Baptist church in the Bible? And so we want to consider that these names are not authorized in the New Testament. But here's what we do know. Did you know the church of the New Testament is specifically called the church of Christ in the Bible? Now, I want you to see it for yourself. Look in Romans chapter 16, and I want to direct your attention to verse number 16. That's Romans 16. Look at verse number 16. The Apostle Paul says, Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. The churches of who? Christ. Does that designation give honor to Christ? Does it show praise and glory to the one who died for it and built the church? Absolutely. Now friend, here's the challenge we would leave with you today. The denominational names that exist today, find those in your Bible. Search the Bible. Are those names in there? Remember, Colossians 3.16 says, whatever we do in word or deed, We've got to do all by the name or the authority of Christ. If you can't find them in the Bible, then friend, how can we say our faith is based on the Word of God and we're a part of the church that you read about in the New Testament? And so in our second or our third lesson, we've noticed these things about evangelism and about these lessons. We've learned that Jesus is the builder and owner of one church. It is His church and He's the head of it. Christ wants unity 
among his followers and he wants them all to be one. For that to exist, we've got to go to the New Testament as our only guide to learn the organization, worship, and name of the church. If we're going to worship as a church the way God wants us to, we've learned that we partake of the Lord's Supper, we teach God's Word, we pray, we sing, we make a contribution on the first day of the week. And we've learned that the name Church of Christ is scriptural and found in the Bible and would be a name that brings glory and honor to God and to His Son. Friend, if you're not a member of the Lord's Church, we're begging you to become one. If you'd like to learn more about how to become a Christian, please call us or write to us or email us. And be sure and stay tuned to our next lesson as we're going to discuss what God says one must do to be a Christian, to be a member of the Lord's body. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.